ません。Buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I would like to start by talking a little bit what is the goal of this symposium and, and, and covering a lot of a little bit of housekeeping. Then we will uh, the the speakers and participants will introduce themselves and then we will start with the with the conversation. So let me start a little bit with uh, what is the goal of this symposium and the format. We thought that given that we have to do this, uh, you know, uh, in, in the screen, rather than uh, the, a, a typical um, panel where each panelist talk a little bit about the research and then there are questions and answers, we thought that maybe uh, be uh, more engaging to have a conversation, a conversation among colleagues that conduct research with uh, Latinx populations about uh, certain uh, questions they have encountered, their experiences, uh, challenge, challenges, opportunities for the future. So we decided to spend this time together among ourselves as if we were having you know, a cafecito or uh, a conversation uh, about those experiences that we have uh, with research, uh, with community engaged research with uh, Latinx populations. Additionally, uh, rather than um, talking about you know, the academic CVs of each of the presenters, we thought that we rather talk about our positionality on how we come uh, to this panel, to this conversation. So we are gonna do that uh, in a minute, but uh, before we start, we thought about having this conversation. We have some questions that we are going to pose to each other. And because it's a conversation, we will all uh, redirect it uh, among each other um, until um, 3.30. And then at 3.30, we are going to open it up to all the participants to this Zoom call. The advantage is that we have a Zoom call so everybody can participate. If you don't mind uh, the participants, if you could mute your microphone and also uh, not to open your video until 3.30 so we can focus on the four panelists. Uh, and then at 3.30, then you can, um, open your video and your um, also your, your microphone to participate. Yes, so we are gonna have a conversation. Participants are going to introduce themselves from then their positionality coming to this panel. And at 3.30, we are going to invite everybody to, to join the conversation with us. So without further ado, uh, anybody that wants to take it away, either Carmela or Kurt or Flavio, Please go ahead, uh, introducing yourselves. Thank you. Okay, I'll jump in and start, uh, Rocio, and thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Kurt Organista. I am an older, i.e. 65-year-old, heterosexual, cisgender, non-disabled, professional, middle-class, married male. Pronouns are he, and him and él and when I'm home in East LA, ese. I'm a professor of uh, social welfare at UC Berkeley. I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I've conducted uh, research in psychotherapy uh, with low income and minority Spanish speaking primary care uh, patients. And more recently have been involved in HIV prevention research with Latino communities in all of their rich diversity. <clears throat> I want to share that I was born and raised in East Los Angeles in a predominantly Mexican descent community and within my large extent, extended uh, family. Uh, my father was the first gender of the family. He went to East LA College, Cal State and Whittier College, and he became 
a, uh, a school teacher and he worked in a number of Latina nonprofits. He was also <laughs> very concerned about Latina well, well-being and was an, an activist. So he was very influential in my development. He raised me with my grandma from Sonora, Mexico. My mom uh, it was from uh, New Mexico, uh, Hatch, New Mexico. It's the chili capital of the world, by the way. If you haven't had Hatch, New Mexico, you need to go out and buy some red or green. And I'm sharing this because they have really, it's really uh, influenced, uh, you know, my direction, you know, as a, as a professional, uh, as an academic, as a researcher, as a psychotherapist, uh, particularly growing up during the Chicano movement between 1965 and 75, roughly, that was my coming of age. You know, people talk about the Chicano moratorium. I actually participated in that. I actually got tear gassed <laughs> during the Chicano moratorium. So. It's had an indelible imprint and influence on my life for which I am deeply grateful. Thank you. Thank you. We do others, social yeah. positions? Carmela or Flavio? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go uh, next. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us and a special uh, thank you to Rocio, Dr. Calvo, and also to the SWER uh, Conference Committee for having this invited um, uh, panel and for the Latinx research tract. I, I tell you, I got really excited going through the, um, the conference program and sort of seeing, you know, sessions flagged uh, with with that designation. So just wanted to um, to highlight that that great effort and, and the fact I think it's the first year that um, that change was implemented. So you know, just uh, thanks to SOAR for that. Uh, so I'm Carmela. I identify as Afro uh, Latina. Um, I was born in the Dominican Republic uh, and also also identify as a first generation immigrant and also a first generation high school, college, PhD, sort of, you know, the list goes on. Um, cisgender, heterosexual, non-disabled woman, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm an associate professor at Columbia School of Social Work, and I, like Kurt, also have a PhD in, in clinical psychology. Um, and really, like, I have a PhD in clinical psychology, but I was trained by some excellent social workers at University of, of Michigan, some of whom I'm so sad I don't get to connect with. Um, who I get to connect with typically at SOAR, but uh, in person, but we'll have to figure out other ways to do that. Um, I also have some postdoctoral expertise in social epidemiology and behavioral medicine and sleep science. And my research uh, focuses on, you know, some descriptive work, which is observational, trying to understand how social determinants are uh, linked to sleep, mental health and cardiovascular health. And then I also um, uh, do research on the intervention side, which is um, specifically thinking about mental health care equity issues. And, and right now it's, it's very focused in the um, space of behavioral sleep medicine. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, as uh, sort of that immigrant uh, identity, uh, even as a first uh, generation immigrant, it's still very much um, instilled in me. And I have a passion for thinking about how, um, to use research as a vehicle to uh, improve access to healthcare services and to mental health care services. And, and part of that stems from, uh, you know, I have many um, examples and some more vivid than others of just bearing witness to family, uh, you know, in the face of different kinds of traumas, just having, and, and because of linguistic barriers or other barriers, just having difficulties accessing mental health. Um, health care, and also just the relationship between mental health um, and physical health. And so, you know, the, the work that I, that I do, it feels um, uh, it's, it's personal, and it's also really motivated from this idea that research is, uh, and can be used as an advocacy uh, tool. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Carmela. Flavio? Yes. Um, buenas tardes um, a todas y a todos. I'm Flavio. Um, I'm in um, Arizona. Uh, some of my students from the class, we just uh, made short and they like that. I think that we, we had a short class today. It was about theory then. Yeah. Um, they're here when some of the 56 people. It's very nice to see that we have 56 participants in this uh, symposium. Um, I am also, uh, like Carmela, an, uh, an immigrant. Uh, in my case, a little bit from uh, farther south, I call it the deep south, uh, Uruguay. 
um, as closer to Antarctica than to the equator. Uh, different music, different food, but the same heart. Um, then I consider myself uh, Latinx, so Latino. I am cis cisgender, but I'm a gay man, um, married. Uh, fortunately, now we can marry. Uh, and we made it through the four years uh, without uh, a change in that. And um, it was good to see the ceremony today. Uh, as an immigrant, uh, I feel very good uh, when uh, we hear that uh, things will get better. Um, I uh, live in, in Arizona and I have gone through uh, all the trauma uh, that our brothers and sisters here have gone through in the last few years, uh, even starting before the Trump administration. Um, and my research uh, uh, tries to inform that and to, it comes out of solidarity. Uh, and a lot of the work we do here, and I always like to say we, because I don't do things on my own, it's always with a community and a team, is um, about intervention research, uh, about health equity, um, trying to uh, eliminate health disparities um, in the Latino community or Latinx community and the American Indian community here. In, um, in Arizona, but also in the last few years, we took our research um, internationally and, and we have now a global uh, center and I'm the director of that global center for um, you know, intervention research. Um, I'm very honored to be part of this panel and, and I um, hope that uh, we all can learn a lot from the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. And I am uh, Rocio Calvo, another immigrant in this panel. I'm also um, a heterosexual, cisgender, non-disabled, uh, first-generation woman. And my uh, the pronouns I use are the she series. Um, I conduct research on the best ways or the best pathways for uh, Latinx communities to engage with uh, social services. And that also come from uh, my life experience and the um, difficulties, um, being part of, of those difficulties uh, where there are systemic barriers, uh, especially for Latinx communities to have access to what they uh, deserve. I work with the community and I, I, I look at, uh, best ways to inform research and to conceptualize it and to implement it with the community and also to bring um, an asset-based perspective on, on what Latinos uh, bring to the table and add to, to the research that we do, especially concerning access to and navigation of social services. So let me ask with the and move on to the first question of, of this conversation, just to start the conversation. Many times or often when we talk about uh, research with uh, Latinx communities, we tend to throw the word or the concept culture. What do you, how you integrate this in your own research? And more importantly, what do you think about this approach and the shortcomings and perhaps opportunities that we have when we frame research with Latinx communities through a cultural perspective or with a cultural lens. And because this is a conversation, I, I, I open it to, to the four of us. I'm happy to jump in. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. We've been communicating a little bit over the weeks and uh, we have uh, some ideas to start with. Um, I wanna say that, you know, to deepen our understanding of Latinx disparities, you know, health and well-being, socioeconomic status, really our social positionality in the American hierarchy of race. We have to uh, study not just culture, not just cultural factors, but social factors. So now I'm kind of using the term socio Latino sociocultural research and practice. And maybe I'm using it for lack of a better term. But for everybody out there listening and doing Latino focused work, 
I'm really hoping that you try your best to identify the most salient social and cultural factors that frame the problems that you're interested in so that, so that the interventions that come from those, uh, that this research uh, can be as, as enlightened as uh, possible. The last thing I'll say before starting off the conversation is, you know, I, as a scholar, I grew up on, on terms like cultural sensitivity and cultural competence, more recently, cultural humility. And as a shout out to uh, Flavio's, uh, the new edition of his book that just came out, Cultural Grounded Research and Practice. These are important uh, terms because they represent a much needed movement in Latino research and practice. But at the same time, if you listen to those terms, they, they really sometimes inadvertently overemphasize cultural when really we need a socio-cultural analysis uh, of various uh, problems because culture and social factors, factors constitute each other. They're always interacting over time and constituting each other. And it's kind of complex and messy, but, but it's what I try to do uh, in my own research. So I'll, I'll stop there. next. Um, I uh, thank you, Kurt, and thank you for, for the book. Uh, one of my co-authors is in the audience. Um, I don't know if we can see her. Uh, Stephanie Lechuga Peña, then um, she deserves also a congratulations on the, on the new edition of the book. Um, thank you, Stephanie. Um, I, I think uh, for me, culture uh, is a big word. It's a beautiful word. Um, you know, my, my dad passed away uh, last year and he was uh, a poet and an artist and, and I learned how to appreciate culture from him. And for him, culture meant uh, perfor the performing arts, but he meant also uh, the way we communicate. Um, everything for him was, was culture. They said, there is nothing without culture. And, and when I came to the Southwest, I learned the phrase, uh, la cultura cura, um, you know, culture heals. And, and, that, and that was part of that tradition, I think. Um, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by cultura or, or culture? Uh, and it means who we are, you know, the, the, the person we are, the, the family we are, the community we are. And, and I think it is important for social workers, uh, you know, we always want to measure things. Um, very difficult to measure everything uh, because culture is everywhere. Um, some of us who grew up in, in, in the Catholic Church, you know, they used to say, what is God? God is everywhere. Well, we can use the same thing here. <laughs> what is culture? Culture is everywhere. The way we dress, the way we talk, the way we cook, the way we, uh, we think about the world, about life and death. Um, mm -hmm. But in social work, I see it mostly uh, as a resource, culture as a resource, um, as an asset, um, as a protective factor. And, and we need to understand it to be able to um, capitalize on it. Um, but on the other hand, I would say, let's try not to romanticize culture because um, in our own cultures of origin, sometimes we have uh, also the biases that exist in, in society in general and a lot of isms. Uh, one that we are finally talking about in part because of our brothers and sisters who have taking the lead on Black Lives Matter uh, movement. Um, we are talking about colorism for the first time, I think, in the Latino community uh, or Latinx community. And, and I think it's very important to talk about that. Um, and colorism may be different on the East Coast that is in the Southwest, but colorism exists uh, in all communities. Then um, in our case, uh, uh, the more indigenous looking a person is in the Latino community, probably the less opportunities a person has. Uh, that talks about colorism. In, in the East Coast, maybe because of our, our brothers from more from a Caribbean background and a stronger Afro uh, you know, um, influence is you know, skin color is very important. And, and the way we look and present ourselves and the way people make assumptions about who we are, then we need to work on that. And, and our interventions need to address that because we cannot continue to ignore uh, the isms that exist and uh, that can be applied to you know, uh, ability status, can be applied to sexual orientation about gender 
and, and many other, um, uh, and avoid stereotypes in the process. Like uh, with gender, we fall into stereotypes with the role of machismo and, and we need to deconstruct that. What does it mean? And then take piece by piece. And I think don't try to do everything at the same time, but when we work in one area, uh, go deeper and, and, um, and avoid the stereotypes. And I think I'll just jump in um, and uh, sort of add um, uh, to this. And I was really glad that Rocio, you started with the big question. I mean, this is like the million dollar question. Um, uh, but one thought, as soon as sort of we, I read culture, what I often um, think about, particularly for those of us engaged in Latinx uh, social work research is acculturation. And this is like, you know, like sort of culture, it's this big, nebulous concept. I think acculturation similarly, some of you have written extensively about this and have um, edited books and whatnot about this. Um, and so I think the, the one of the major shortcomings I think of applying the acculturation construct that, that happens and I see it and I often uh, challenge myself and I think other, other colleagues to think really critically about what is it that you mean when you say acculturation? We know what it is, right? It's this multi-domain, multi-dimensional process that happens when unfamiliar cultures are, are interacting and it's related to the practices, it's related to your values, it's related to the way you self-identify. But when you're doing research, not just on the concept of acculturation, but culture, acculturation, sociocultural factors and some health outcome, if it's physical health or mental health, really thinking uh, conceptually and critically about what is, you know, how do you get from this nebulous uh, construct to that health outcome? And then what are these intermediary pathways? And can we measure what's most salient that intersects with culture and acculturation? And then that would be more closely tied to that health outcome. So, you know, one example is obesity, right? So if someone's interested in acculturation and obesity in Latinx communities, you know, thinking through, well, is it what along those different dimensions is it that you're hypothesizing would be the would affect uh, or or be um, you know in that causal pathway to affect someone uh, someone's obesity risk? So maybe it's about dietary practices and a, you know measures of acculturation that are talking specifically about diet. Then sort of tackling all the different dimensions, which some of which may or may not be more closely related to that health outcome. Um, in my own research, I try to think really critically about this, particularly um, some, you know, the, the research that I do, is, it is about sociocultural factors and social determinants and health. Um, but often I think a lot about stress, sort of through stress pathways. So making sure, you know, if I'm interested in these larger constructs of acculturation or, or culture, um, but I'm really interested in, in mental health, for me, what's most important to measure is the distress from that process. You know, is someone experiencing distress along different dimensions, and then that how that then is related to some, you know, health marker or sleep marker. Um, so I think that's like that's one of the shortcomings. I think is that we have used it. It's like part of our, le our lexicon to be like card carrying. You have to have it in a paper, in a manuscript. But all the the short, you know, the disadvantage is that it becomes sort of this empty term and and often not you know, that kind of causal pathway or theoretical model that's, that's really thinking through sort of all the different ways in which you get from, from culture to, to health um, does not get ex explained. So just, I think really there, there's sort of like a call there um, um, uh, to do that. And, other, you know, there's been lots of critiques about acculturation. I'm curious what other folks have to say uh, uh, about this as well. I, I like what you say. Um... Uh, about um, coming up with models that uh, that integrate the measure of so if we are gonna if we are talking about culture what are we going what are we talking about are we talking about uh, the way we see the world are we talking about our values are we talking about the music that we listen or the poetry are we talking about the decisions we make raising our kids are we talking about so if culture is everything, how we pinpoint at it in the behavior that we are trying to explain or to measure or to modify or to prevent. 
in a way that, as Flavio was saying, is intersectional. Because how you talk about culture, if you don't bring all the other aspects, such as colorism, discrimination, racism, that also differs across Latinx communities, and that, more importantly, is context specific. Because it's not the same when in the same thing in the Southwest or in the Northeast or in the, it, it really varies. And also by generation status, immigration status. It's interesting what Kurt also say uh, about bringing the, 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 the context in acculturation, given that, you know, as, as many of you have written, maybe second generations, uh, you know, la, la cultura cura, what happened when you, when, when culture is not a protective factor anymore? Well, it's not only that culture is not a protective factor anymore, is that second generation immigrants are more exposed systemically to experiences of otherism that are first generation immigrants. They may be in general more, uh, if you won't protect it, especially if you don't speak the language. So, so all these factors, I agree with all of you in social work, uh, I think there is an opportunity there. Rather than say a shortcoming, I think there is an opportunity to tease out, to identify what do we mean when we talk uh, about culture. It's not an static concept. It's dynamic and it's context specific. How we measure it and then thinking through on those models that when we, you know, we're trying to prevent or to explain or to modify behavior with our research and the community, how we integrate all of that. Hey, can I suggest that we all unmute ourselves, not, not to interrupt each other, but for it to be a little more like a conversation? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Carmela, what, what I wanted to say was, uh, you know, I'm sort of, uh, again, because of my age and generation, you know, I'm kind of a, an acculturation convert, you know, mm -hmm. for Amado Padilla's you know, first book on acculturation, which really took it seriously, it had John Barry and was talking about acculturation of minorities. And for me, you know, it, it, it was important because it helped me frame the key historical uh, factors that, uh, you know, have led to the positionality of different race and ethnic groups in America. So for, so it's been important in that sense. And while, while I think measuring acculturation got played out, you know, like, you know, we did it and it sort of related to some things and not to other things. Uh, you know, it has been useful. If you look at Margarita Alegria's work on acculturation and mental health, you know, and she's uh, just a giant in the world of mental health research. She, she shows, and she shows over and over that the more acculturated you are as a Latino, and what does that mean? It just means the more exposure to America, as Rocio just said, that you know the higher level of certain mental disorders not all, not all of them but the ones that are really related to distress like affective disorders anxiety disorders alcohol and substance use those those consistently go up they concern me they make me wonder what is it about the minority experience that's doing that and what is it about culture that that might mitigate some of that and then lies the battle the social and cultural factors kind of fighting for the outcome of, of, of the populations that we care about. And I think there is utility to the, like, to the, um, to the concept and uh, uh, definitely agree. I think often it just, it isn't, it, it's sort of like the term is applied and assumed is what it means without really sort of fleshing it out. Or like, you know, I think, um, uh, Maggie's work, you know, has shown or has looked at different indicators or proxies of acculturation, whether it's language, whether it's, um, you know, whether someone's an immigrant or not, and 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 uh, shown just just what you said that you know where where there might be greater um, risk as opposed to these measures. You know, Barry's work was all about sort of understanding the acculturation process itself, right? And um, yeah. Right? Kind of historical. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that, which I think is good in, in of itself, but when we're, you're interested in health, I think really thinking really critically about how that's, how that's measured and why you think it's related uh, to some health outcome. And just briefly, uh, Rocio, I, 
uh, my interest is also acculturation and uh, what I think is good um, that is happening with Latinx researchers and other researchers uh, that study acculturation and culture in general is now we are dismystifying uh, things, concepts like uh, or constructs that, like the paradox, the, the Latinx paradox, or that we know that uh, those were not um, applicable in many cases and they were oversimplifications. Uh, and because in this panel we have three uh, immigrants and, and we can make um, Kurt an honorary immigrant for, for today. Thank uh, you, Blasio. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> We, we know that immigration uh, doesn't happen like uh, randomly, that those who migrate are not representative of a whole population. Uh, it's a very biased sample of people. Uh, and then to uh, use that uh, paradox sometimes had put down second generation uh, Latinx people saying, if you were only more like the first generation people, everything would be fine. And, and that's a really, you know, simplification, oversimplification yeah. of reality. And, and again, it's the, the problem with some research that always compares people and they compare them the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know, why do we always have to be comparing? Everybody should be healthy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the main goal. And mm -hmm. then uh, comparing and comparing, even sometimes the way we do with health disparities research, why do we have to compare always ourselves with white people? You know, white middle class people. I mean, sometimes Latinx people look better than white middle class people. And then we have to change the way we do the research in, in, in order to avoid oversimplifications. And I think acculturation is a great example for that. I know we had to move to the next topic. <laughs> Agree. And, and, and talking about opportunities and to <clears throat> make things more complex, the way we conceptualize it and the way we look at it and we look at comparison. Sometimes, and I don't want to generalize, but sometimes in social work by default, we tend to focus the unit of analysis in the individual which is not bad or good on itself, but may sometimes we don't give enough uh, importance or attention to, 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 to social determinants, to systems, to, to um, that influence definitely the behavior of the population we work with. Uh, what is your experience with this? What are your ideas? What opportunities do you see for our profession? In, to expand research uh, in integrating in culture acculturation within the whole large and, and, and big diversity of Latinx communities, systems, structures in an integrative way, not, not as a, a tick box, you know? And now we, I'm gonna talk about the social determinants as an add on, but really integrated there. And if you have examples or, or that you can share. I don't know, you want me to start? Perfect. Yeah, sure. go for it. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I think we, we uh, were talking about, uh, um, you know, COVID-19, um, mm -hmm. you know, the pandemic as an example, uh, a tragic um, pandemic for 100,000 people that we lost that we should have not. Um, yeah. And our heart goes out to their families um, and friends and co-workers. Um, in our case, uh, although the center that I'm more involved now is, is uh, more global, uh, we, because we have a, a health disparities uh, research center as well that I'm the principal investigator, I, I got involved into this RADx um, awards that NIH gave for COVID-19 to make testing um, available to those who have less access to testing. And then in, in the case of Arizona, like most of the nation means people of color and um, then we just went to Yuma, Arizona to do the, the, the project, the testing. Uh, and we work with community health workers to make testing available in a culturally appropriate or uh, a congruent way. Um, and, and what we learned is that uh, every morning at three o'clock in the morning, uh, thousands of farm workers cross from um, San Luis Rio, Colorado into San Luis, uh, Arizona, the border and they uh, are picked up by buses and, and, and trucks to go to the fields and work all day based on their speciality. You know, some people are experts on picking tomatoes or whatever. They're basically picking up all the good food that we eat, uh, all the healthy food, all the fresh vegetables and fruits. And, and they didn't have any access to testing. And they were uh, boarding these buses very crowded 
then social distancing is, is, is an impossibility. Um, and, and that was for us an eye-opening open, uh, experience. You know, we knew the conditions were really bad, but um, going there, seeing how the system is failing, you know, thousands of, 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 of individuals who are doing only good for us, you know, uh, and, and they don't have access to anything. And, and that's one example of many others. And what is the role of social work with that? And I think one thing is what we're doing, you know, doing something, <laughs> helping in any small way we can, but also we need, we have the resp responsibility of documenting that, yeah. um, to, to writing about it, to finding solutions, even at the smallest level, uh, but then also to make recommendations for policy. And then maybe in the next four years, we have many more chances of influencing policy. Mm -hmm. Then if we don't have the documentation and we don't document the need, it's not to be morbid that we do it. We do it because we need the evidence. Uh, we need the evidence to inform policy and to inform services that we're more responsive to the needs of our communities. Um, then I think that would be one example that uh, I would like to share, Rocio. Thank you. Let, let, just quickly, let me jump in. It, you, it, I relate when you said from social work, we have this responsibility to document it so we can then um, influence and, and, and use it to, to make systemic change. I am conducting now a uh, I have a project with, uh, with older immigrants, Latinx is from different countries. As you may know, uh, the immigration that we have since 2008 from uh, Latin America is immigrants 55 and over. We have almost zero immigration otherwise. So I've been following this population actually throughout, I started right before the pandemic. I mean, all during the pandemic in the field with them. And, uh, and we have recent arrivals, people that have been here five years or, or less in their 70s, 80s, 90s, uh. without access to anything because of the current immigration laws that we have, people that have been unable to, uh, to translate their, to, to use their prior uh, education or profession they come here, they have access to nothing, health insurance, nothing, absolutely nothing. They are isolated. Many of them have to work because they can, otherwise they cannot make ends meet. They have had no relief with the pandemic. No, no, obviously no unemployment, not a stimulus check. And, and that's the population that is very, very much invisible. In, 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 in general, in, in social work, but in general, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, Latinx communities, and, and I think we have an opportunity there to document what is going on with recent uh, Latinx immigrants that are, uh, you know, older adults, and, and what we can do about it by, by documenting it. And, and I think one thing that I, at least I'm thinking, you know, we documented it in, in, in scholarly publications, but I think also more in, in op-eds, in, in, in making noise for, for, a, for a lack of a better word to, to say, hey, pay attention to this. So anyway, let me stop there. I just, I had to jump in when, you know, Flavio was talking about Good. it. Good, it's the conversation. <laughs> I think Rocio, I don't. I have sort of a related thought, but it but it gets to what you're um, saying uh, a bit, which is, um, you know, there was uh, I had done a project. I don't see with, with uh, Leo Cabasa, who wasn't here. We did a, a project a few years ago with RWJ that was focused on Latinx health data disaggregation, and it was really just trying to understand, like. We know, just as we've been talking about on this panel, that there are differences, you know, uh, that the Latinx population is diverse and how do we, um, uh, you know, describe that documented, tested and consider it in interventions. And what I found interesting, I think to your point and RWJ did too, is that, I mean, you know, of all the papers, almost 2000 papers that we screened over a 10 year period, um, of, and this is, you know, uh, public health data, so included physical health and mental health outcomes. I mean, 
of all those papers, only 30% actually looked at within group differences in the Latinx population. And then even by, you know, uh, heritage group or background or culture of origin, you know, sort of choose the term, like less than 10% of those articles did that. So we talk, we talk a lot about this, but in practice, it's actually not happening. And I think just to your point, so this is what's happening in research, I think in the broader, uh, um, you know, sort of mass kind of media kind of conceptualization, these within important Latino, within Latino group differences, I think just what you're highlighting among older, older adult recent immigrants, I mean, that's definitely a population that's not talked about. We're not, we're not doing, I think we're not doing enough in, in research and there's a great opportunity there. And I think in getting that message to the larger public um, about the, the need, you know, for um, looking at within group differences and it will allow us to create more targeted interventions, identify those groups that are highest risk, like, you're, like you mentioned, who are likely to be rendered invisible if we just look at them in the aggregate. So there's, I think as we think about interventions and like document, documenting the work, as you said, um, Flavio, right, it begins with the research questions that we're asking and, you know, at the hypothesis stage all the way to when you're interpreting it and then disseminating the work. Um, so just wanted to sort of put in a plug for, um, um, yeah, for the fact that we, we we're talking a lot about it, but in, in fact, uh, we're not, um, it, we're not publishing on that or it's not getting published. So that's a whole other, I think, related conversation. You know, when you were uh, talking, Flavio, about uh, COVID, you know, I think it's a perfect example of structural vulnerability you know, either 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 the COVID virus is really really racist, <laughs> or it's it's exploiting the racial fault lines uh, in America, and that's why it over affects Native people and African Americans and Latino uh, people. You know, I've I've done my research on on the other pandemic, HIV AIDS, and it's the same thing. You know, either either the virus is is uh, racist and 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 sexist because of the way it over affects women. Black women, for example, seven times as much HIV risk than uh, white women. Or, you know, it's exploiting all these, these fault lines. Uh, I, I wanted to study uh, uh, day laborers. You know, you mentioned farm workers, Flavio, and I think of day, day laborers as the urban counterpart of farm workers, right? You know, overwhelmingly undocumented, chronically underemployed. You know, they have uh, terrible working mm -hmm. And then you have discrimination on top, right? That's exacerbating everything. So, you know, when I was, so, you know, for me to expand upon behavioral factors or to go back to what I was saying earlier, to, to, to try to find the most salient social and cultural factors that are the context of risk, you know, my, my research has focused more on, on developing and testing models of risk. So, you know, uh, very briefly, I was able to show in my research that these things like discrimination and terrible working and living conditions, they really do result in alcohol and substance related sexual risk taking, but they also do it by way of risk and, and protective factors. Some of the, some of the cultural protective factors that uh, I found in my research are very interesting. You know, they, since I was working in uh, the mission district of San Francisco, a, a Latino community, you know the 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 day laborers that I worked with they they were they were able to share that those nonprofit centers that serve day laborers like the day labor centers and health that they really mattered, and I used their definition of uh, cultural competence. I said, well, what what was helpful? They said the services and know how to treat Latinos that actually helped me with my problems. What better definition could you have of cultural competence? The other protective factor. Uh, that, that protect against distress and sexual risk taking and problem drinking was being in contact with their families in Central America mm -hmm. and Mexico. The more that they texted back and forth, sent letters, sent money, of course, that's the whole reason for being in the US, right? You know, the more protected they were, they were. But at the same time, when they, when they were feeling the distress, you know, you know to uh, use the term that came up earlier, when they were really most distressed by discrimination, poor work, poor housing, they didn't want to bother their families in Mexico. They didn't want, I said, why aren't you talking to your family? They'd say, I don't want to worry them. I don't want to upset them with my problems. 
And so there were a lot of implications here for interventions from the micro level. We talked to the men about, you know, familismo is a two way street. You know, they do want to know how you're doing. They want to help you too. It's not just you helping them. That was a kind of on the micro level. On the macro level, we got to give these folks work authorization. That would be a, that would be a macro level intervention that would do the most to, uh, to decrease risk in what the men called desesperacion, speaking of cultural factors that came up so much that we measured it, we validated the scale, published the scale. So those are some of the implications that, that come from practice that I think tries its best to uh, identify the salient social and cultural factors that are sociologically, you know, all in, you know, dynamic flux. Thank you for that, everyone. Is I think we have 15 minutes remaining for this panel and uh, we are going to, as we promised, open uh, the conversation to the whole floor. Uh, I saw a hand raised, uh, I believe it was Laura. Am I right? Yes, Laura. Can you please uh, turn the video on? And it's good to see you. Hi, great to see you too. Um, this is a wonderful panel. Thank you all for, 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 for all of this great information. So I have a little bit of a, um, I agree with everything about, uh, you know, investigating and doing research with Latinx communities, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to hear from your experience as found, funded NIH researchers, what do we do when we encounter um, let's say an institute that says, well, we don't need to investigate trauma in every population, right? Trauma is trauma is trauma. Why do we need to investigate it in recent immigrants? Because um, I, have, I have heard that uh, from folks at NIH and that, that's just something that I think we need to come to terms with as a discipline and think about how we, we, address, we address these challenges. Um, so I would really like to hear uh, your, your, all of your thoughts on, on that. Thank you. Well, I can start and then my colleagues can um, contribute their ideas too. Uh, thank you, Laura, for, for the question. I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. I, I get those kind of comments. And what I learned over the years, uh, I've been getting funded by NIH for like 20 some years now, um, is that I'm very careful about what panel do I send. <laughs> You know, you have a choice of picking the panel, and I look very carefully who is in the panel, and and usually I can guess who will get my um, application based on their expertise, and you know, um, and it will take a long time for us to change all the reviewers. Um, then in the meantime, while we work on that and changing uh, their hearts and their minds, um, we need to be practical, uh, because if not, your research doesn't get funded, and then I think we have to do both things at the same time. Uh, work on changing uh, and, and, and making real change, but also be practical and don't go to a place that you know they don't, they don't understand what you're trying to do, and you will get a really bad score, and you will not get funded, and your research needs to get funded. I'll just say, I think, uh, it, the buzzword these days is, is trauma-informed care and, and for good reasons. And uh, all the literature we're seeing on recent immigrants is talking about the, the trauma before migrating, the trauma during migrating, the trauma after migrating. Um, I, I, there's a recent article on a integrated behavioral uh, healthcare population of Latinos that actually were, were referred for mental health care uh, who were just overwhelmingly, you know, um, uh, traumatized by uh, their their uh, immigrant journey, and you know, uh, another new area is people that are impacted by detention and deportation, right? Not just the people, but their family members and the community members that that stay behind. So, we, th that has to be front and center on our research agenda, and we have to keep pushing. And uh, if not, you know, uh, it's not just at the, you know level of federal funding, but you know, like all research, we have to start off locally and find some small, you know, the low hanging fruit, right? And you take, you take small grants and then you use that to get bigger grants and, and hopefully 
uh, some federal funding because that does allow us to kick off kick our research into a higher higher level. Yeah, and thanks, Noto, for the for the question. It's so good to to see you. I think I, I agree with what um, uh, my colleagues mentioned. The um, you know, it seems like part of it is is like a strategy, right? And I think that's probably what you're asking is like, what's the strategy? This is work I'm really passionate about, and how do I get this work funded? Um, and there's probably some strategy around the institute. I think, like Flavio said, the exact uh, you know um, study section or section that it's sent. Um, there's a separate question that I don't know, you didn't say you're asking, so I'm sort of throwing it out there, which is, you know, this is the work that you're most passionate about. And like, how do you do, how do you still do this trauma work and yet get the funding that you need for, you know, whatever setting you might, yes, that's it, I get the thumbs up, be in. And, you know, I've heard sort of different um, uh, creative answers to that question. I think finding sort of a, a different institute might be helpful. I think if, if there's a I don't know the grant, but if there's, um, if, you know, the feedback you received, there, more, there was more excitement on one aspect of it, you know, how could you still include the trauma me measures and, and the other pieces while still, while reframing it so that you can still get the, the funds to build the infrastructure you need to do the work, but still making sure that you do the work that you're really passionate about. Um, I think what should be really clear is that all four of us are really passionate about this um, area and for different reasons. And so like, I'm a, you know, I'm a big believer is especially, um, you know, to do the work that you're passionate about, that's going to ensure that you'll, you'll be able to do high quality work, um, and happy to talk offline and think strategically. Um, though it's hard sort of to do right without the, the specifics, but I think you heard some great, great, um, initial thoughts. I, I agree with all my colleagues and I, I'm a lot, I'm also available. Uh, if you, well, I know you've asked Laura, but you know, uh, if you uh, um, you want to connect uh, offline and, and strategize, but uh, some of the strategies that I have used are uh, looking at other angles, like you know, for instance, now focusing in populations that we don't know much about, like older, you know, Latinx immigrants. They are the fastest growing segment of the baby boomers if the, of, the, of the United States that are the only immigrants that are coming. They have increased 20% in the you know, last 10 years. And looking at the one strategy I use, looking at the segment of the population that maybe we don't know as much about, then those variations that we talked before, right? Country of origin, trauma, but with all those variations. So I go where I wanna go, but maybe that's not my main focus, but I get that there. I get, you know, I go to foundations, I get that, you know, pilot data, and then I go to, to you know, to bigger endeavors, if you want. So, but uh, I follow, and, and you know, and, and, and I used to rejection, but, you know, from time to time I got, hey, I wanna hear more. So that, that's one of the pathways I, I have followed. But I'm happy to connect offline if, if you want. Yeah, thank you for saying that, Rosia. Maybe just a last comment. I, I, Laura, I worked with a with like a, a you know, a, a federally, you know, funded guru, <laughs> you know, who uh, told me to I, that I should apply to NIAAA, which is you know, alcohol abuse and, uh, and addictions. And I said, I'm not an alcohol researcher. <laughs> He said, well, you are now, because that's where you're probably going to get your funding because you have alcohol in your model. And sure enough, it, it happened. And then I started to get invited to all these alcohol-related co conferences. And I had to say, I'm not really an alcohol researcher. You know, I'm more of a Latino, you know, structural environmental researcher. But, but I, guess I, I guess you have to be sometimes when you're doing the grant writing. Thank you um, for all your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Others, esperate. Okay, the session is scheduled to end in five minutes. So we have time for, we have five for five more minutes. Anyone wants to jump in, please. Hi everyone, um, I, wonderful panel. Thank you and thank you for the sword leadership to basically put this Latino issues front and center. I know these conversations have been, 
we have been having these conversations about the need to do this for, for a few years already. It's great to see this uh, implemented today. Um, quick question, just to uh, take away from your vast experience in more institutional grounding. Um, what, do you, what do you recommend for uh, Latino, non-Latino researchers? Any takeaway for those researchers to promote, to, to put front and center a, uh, a, a, an understanding of the Latino population, particularly as it's becoming, you know, a majority in many aspects, you know, not only in certain urban settings, but also in certain domains, like in terms of children, certain age, or people, uh, public health issues. Uh, we talked about COVID and, you know, it's become a majority, repres basically represent a majority in not only bad things, but really great things. So what would you recommend for researchers to front and center Latino research? Uh, what might be some strategies? Um, I can start maybe quickly. I'm good to see you, Eric. Um, I, I think your institution needs to make an investment on it, uh, especially if you don't have yet um, a, a center that uh, has Latinx research as a priority. Um, but I'm sure there are individual researchers that are doing the work. Then if the institution can provide some funding to start some kind of an office, think tank, I don't know, center, whatever nomenclature the institution uses, I think it's good to bring people together uh, and, and start um, supporting each other because doing it individually, sometimes people feel um, isolated and, and uh, you know, it's always better as a team. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer also it's easier to get funded than externally. And, and my experience is uh, the higher ups uh, invest when you have a plan then you have to have a plan and say, okay, if you give me this money in three years, I will be able to get this kind of money you know, from the feds. And there has to be some kind of a good uh, strategy and our community needs that. Uh, then I think it's a good use of our time to develop. It's almost like having a business plan, but we need to do that uh, for, for the higher ups to take us seriously and, and to invest on us and, and, and then get more, more support later. That would be one idea. Uh, are we going to say something, Carmela? Pass it. Oh, um, gracias, Kurt. Uh, I think I was just going to. Um, pivot, not answer the question, but answer the question. What, what that question reminded me and a little bit about what Flavio um, was talking about, which you're, you know, um, I think both of you were talking, you know, within an institution and assuming a certain level of power and a certain sort of um, uh, professional level, I guess I, I, that question for some reason made me think about the pipeline as well and sort of like what could, you know, what are and I know this conversation happened that SOAR has happened before with, with probably several of us here on the call, but I think it's just so important to think about how do we uh, train and empower the pipeline, right? So the more of us doing this kind of work and thinking really thoughtfully about, about culture, about disaggregation, about sort of funding and moving this, this work, important work on Latinx health research, the, the more I think we can see um, various kinds of institutions recognize this work. So um, I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's this multi-pronged strategy, both, you know, that everyone I think actually en would end up playing an important role in, in contributing to the development of this field and of, re and of Latinx social worker, social work researchers. Eric, your, your question uh, had kind of a breath to it that we, we can all read different answers into. I would, I would just add that my own, my own work is, is, is not just about day laborers or jornaleros per se. It's about the structural, it's about the structural vulnerability of Latino populations. So it's theoretically driven. And as such, it's, it's meant to uh, 
to be there for others to, you know, engage with that framework for whatever problem and population they're they're dealing with. So it has a it has a, a trans a hopefully a generalizability. Thank you. Uh, we are uh, out of time, unfortunately. The hour went really fast. But we just got started, Orsio. I know, I know. We have to do another, you know, a whole day, you know, in that way. Otra, otra. Otra, otra. Otra, We can take the coffee, but we can do a potluck, you know. <laughs> but um, I want to thank all, all of you, all the panelists, all the participants. I really want to, to throw a shout out to the SWORD leadership. Less than a year ago, we came up with, you know, ideas of how to enhance uh, and made a specific Latinx research in, uh, at SOAR and they responded immediately. Now we have a, a, um, a cluster um, research space just for us. And um, so I really, really want to appreciate how, how they have throw, you know, every, how welcome this has been by, by the SWORD leadership. And a plug there, we are going to have our SIG, a special interest group. After this week, I submitted it. If you remember last year, it was over 60 of us at 7 a.m. in the morning, Latinos. <laughs> Everybody was on time. <laughs> so uh, we are having this uh, this year. Hopefully, it won't be at 7 a.m. in the morning. It's going to be online. But I already submitted it, and I will keep uh, everybody updated but i'm looking forward to see all of you there maybe we then can discuss next uh, some of the things we have discussed there and others of how we move forward uh latinx center research uh in social work thank you Rocio. muchas gracias <laughs> un abrazo a la distancia muchas gracias adios. gracias adios gracias. Gracias. gracias nos vemos nos vemos gracias